Welcome to the Open Textbook Network Winter Webinar Series, Building an Open Textbook Publishing Program. My name is Karen Lauritsen. I'm Managing Director with the Open Textbook Network. And this is the final webinar in a series of three webinars that we offered our community and the Library Publishing Coalition community as part of a webinar exchange. Our two organizations became strategic affiliates last fall, and this is one of many upcoming collaborations. If you have any questions about these webinars, please contact me. As I just noted, the series will be recorded and shared. Imba and I uh, would like to acknowledge that many of you attending have a lot of great experience in publishing OER as well. So we invite you to chime in with your resources and examples during the presentation in the chat. At the end of Imba's presentation, we'll have time to discuss your stories as well as answer questions. So on this slide, you can see some of the publishing resources and member support that the OTN offers for our members and for the higher education community at large. And one of the ways that we support our members is through partnerships, the latest of which is with the Collaborative Knowledge Foundation, which we just recently announced. And we would like to invite you to join us at the Library Publishing Forum pre-conference in Vancouver coming up on May 8th when we'll spend the day focused on publishing OER. And as of yesterday, there were only five spots left. So if this is something you would like to attend, we encourage you to sign up as soon as possible. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our featured guest, Imba Kehoe. Imba is the Copyright and Scholarly Communications Librarian at the University of Victoria Libraries. She graduated with an MLS from the University of Toronto and has a BA in English and History. Her first career was as a teacher in Singapore, where she taught in elementary and high schools for six years. She then worked at Queen's University before coming out west to join the University of Victoria in 1998. So Imba, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Karen. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, good. I'm very pleased to be here. Thanks to both Karen and Melanie for inviting me to present today. I enjoyed the previous two webinars in the series with John Warren and Kevin Hawkins. They have addressed a number of issues that you need to think about when developing a publishing project or program. Today, we're going to look at one example of a library publishing program, one that was developed at the University of Victoria Libraries. You may already be doing some of these pieces, and like Karen mentioned, please feel free to share in the chat with others as we go along. I'll talk about how we developed our publishing service from a project-based pilot phase to a full-fledged full -fledged program. I will also cover some of the challenges that we've had to overcome at the end. We still have a few things that we'd like to add, but it will come in time. So a little background about the University of Victoria, if you don't know where we are. The university is located on Vancouver Island and is part of the province of British Columbia. We are a research institution with PhD programs and have a joint medical program with two other universities in the province. We have approximately 18,000 full-time students. And very important in this piece is that we don't have a university press currently at the university. So where are we at at present? Currently, we have a library imprint with two publication streams running in tandem. The focus for each is different. One focused on special collections and archives. We're working with faculty and librarians to publish content that showcases the archives, linking it to what may be of interest to faculty and students, possibly cost related. The other is focused on scholarly content that is journals, monographs, and textbooks. The intention here is to advance research and teaching at the university and to disseminate research from grant-funded projects. We use an author pay model where funding comes from the research grants or university grants. The books are published under a CC license. Staffing in each area is different, as you can see from the slide. It's spearheaded by two different librarians, and the services in each area are still evolving. So how did we get to these two 
publication programs. Where did we start? I was given a two-year half-time secondment in scholarly publishing in 2007 to explore what's happening on campus and to suggest a strategy that we could take to expand the library's role and services. First, I started by scanning department websites. I found about seven to eight student journals that were hosted and published via these websites. The journals were hosted on a variety of platforms. I also noticed that there were some other types of publication outputs on campus. For example, the geography department produced a geographical series and math published a technical paper series. Coincidentally, around this time, PKP's online journal system software was also released. I tested the software and explored the options offered. In the end, we chose the option to host multiple journals on one installation in order to build capacity for the service. Next, I contacted the editors and told them about what the library could offer. We offered to bring their journals into the system and show them how to use it. We created a small service option, which included setup, documentation to publish final PDFs, archiving and preservation of content, as well as some technical support. As we were launching the student journals, we had queries from two existing peer-reviewed journals that wanted to move online and publish under an open access model. We offered the same service options to them. Later, we formalized our agreement with an MOU. As the service developed, we were asked to help create a new peer-reviewed journal. Now, we have a journal publishing service with about 30 journals. We determined the capacity for the service on the resources we have. We tend to take in about two to three new journals a year, we have one librarian with 50% time allocated in this area. We also continue to have some dedicated time from a programmer for upgrades and to resolve any technical questions. We provide training to the students, faculty and staff to be self-sufficient in using the software. I want to note that with the students, it's hard to maintain a training routine as the editorial board changes from year to year. What I offer now is help with uploading their final issue on the website. It takes about half an hour of staff time. Here is the MOU that we created for our affiliated journals uh, on campus. We assist with setup, establish a unique account, and provide training. The contents are accessible 24-7. We keep the software updated and digitally archive and preserve all journal content. We also provide DOIs for faculty and association journals. So how do we move from publishing journals to publishing books? Well, in a way, it was serendipity. Our faculty actually gently prodded us in this direction. So what happened? Our first project was initiated by one of our journal editors who had the idea of amalgamating two issues of the journal into a book. We started quietly to test the waters and to develop our capacity in this area. I used some of the skills from the journal publishing area and learned about the book workflow process on the fly. With this project, we benefited from having articles that were already edited we had to agree on the final output format, which was PDF and print. I asked for funding to hire a designer because we did not have this, cap this capacity in-house at the time. I learned how to do an RFP. We had no in-house capacity, so I, I spoke to the purchasing department on campus. They knew about existing contracts with designers. I could bypass the RFP process by hiring one of these designers. We were able to get ISBNs from another department in the library. We've learned about the CIP application process via Library and Archives Canada. I guess in the States, it's through the Library of Congress. Uh, and these make the books more discoverable. 
we host all our books in the institutional repository where a handle is automatically assigned. We worked and still continue to work with the bookstore on campus, whom we have had a great relationship with, to sell our books on a print-on-demand model. The titles are also added to our library catalog. It took us a few years before we figured out our workflow and how to work with faculty in this process. We slowly started picking up more titles and have added textbooks as well. At this point, I think it's a good uh, stop to sort of recap what the difference is between working on a project and working with a program. Projects tend to be one-off efforts and produced one at a time. There's a predefined scope, outcome, and costs are limited. It's completed within a short time frame and has fewer stakeholders. One thing to remember is one-off projects may still have large expectations. A program, on the other hand, is enterprise-based. There is an undetermined end date. It tends to be longer term and run over many years and includes multiple staff. There's a need for funding, especially staff resources, and creating a sustainability plan. It's based on larger ambitions. For example, creating greater institutional impact. There's collaboration usually within the organization, outside, and nationally. Multiple projects can also lead to a larger program like an open textbook program. So let's get into our book publishing service, which has been evolving over the last 10 years. Our press website is at the bottom of this slide, and I'll repeat it for you. It's at oac.uvic.ca slash press. Here are some examples of the books we have published. We created a vision for our program or our service, and it's derived from the university's strategic plan, which is to enhance the societal benefit derived through mobilization of research knowledge across disciplines. The mission for our service is to extend the reach and reputation of the university to, through the publication of scholarly, artistic, and educational books and journals that advance research, teaching, and learning. So what does this mean on the ground? The service is primarily a digital open access publishing program. It aims to explore new modes of scholarly publishing while making works available simultaneously in print and digital formats for a varied audience. Each book project comprises a one-time commitment from the author and the library. There is a relationship between each project in the quality, style, branding, and the services we offer. The program works with scholars at the university to enable success in knowledge dissemination. We tend to publish about three books a year on average. All the books are grant funded. We use an author pay model. The trend so far is that we've gotten requests from our tenured faculty. The outputs are hosted in the institutional repository and the textbooks are hosted on the Pressbooks platform at BC campus. We're not a press, but a service and not competing with traditional presses for content. I'll explain this in a bit more detail in the next few slides. Here's our full service menu. We offer a suite of services as an alternative to traditional channels and provide wide dissemination of research at a lower cost. Quality in production is what is important in our workflow and eventual output. I'll focus on three aspects of this workflow in order to give you time for questions at the end. And if you want other pieces covered, I can certainly talk about them. But for this session, I'll talk about the initial review, design and cost, and marketing and indexing. In the initial review, what we have is we ask the authors to submit a book proposal. 
And in the book proposal, the author submits sample chapters. The proposal also provides information on the author's intentions and expectations for completion. They provide the author's assessment on impact of the subject matter and audience information. We get a chance to look at the proposed table of contents for the book as well. We do an initial review in our office to assess our capacity to fill, fulfill these requirements. They will include determination around whether we're doing an in-house or outsourcing the project, time required for reviewing copyright permissions and finding alternative sources, time that we might need for checking references, and assessing timelines of one book project in relation to any other projects we have at that moment. It's crucial to take into account possible project timeline overlaps. You may have the same staff working on all the projects, so determining when to bring in other staff, delaying the start of one project in order to get another project to another phase in the project production cycle will be an important consideration. Eventually, the proposal will be reviewed by the university librarian and one of our associate university librarians with feedback from my office. One of the things that we look at is also diversity, equity, and inclusion of our titles. Interestingly, so far, the projects have covered all of these areas. We've not actually gone looking for them necessarily. It may be that the authors know that traditional publishers would not be accepting their book proposals because of the unique and esoteric content. A big part of this may also be that authors want to make their books openly accessible. So what have we received? I'll just go back two slides to look at the books examples. So we've had projects developed out of research and internal grants. So the funding from these grants actually allow us to hire the external designer to work on the project. The other kinds of projects we've had are books for students. So it would be an example of an online textbook. And the Technical Writing Essentials textbook is one of them. Uh, the Web of Performance test textbook came out of, of a research project in education around teaching drama in high schools. Uh, books that may not have a market, sorry, books that may not have a market with the traditional publishers. So the bottom left corner, we have Knowing Home. This was a book that was initially accepted by UBC Press, but later they rejected it because there was no market for selling it. This was a government funded research project looking at looking towards impending changes that were coming in the school curriculum for high schools and co-authored by indigenous authors. Eventually, the publication was funded by BC Campus. The True Trunk Candy My Pillow was an interesting project for us. We worked with a museum in Vancouver who helped get the funding needed for the book design. It was also part of the Landscapes of Injustice project on our campus in the history department. It was related to the Japanese internment. And this specifically was one man's memories of that time. The law textbook called Global Corruption had students as co-authors. We have also been converting course manuals into textbooks and, and we go keep going on with this kind of thing. Now I'll go back to my slide. So once the, the book proposal is um, accepted by our university librarian and the AUL, we look in greater detail at this book and uh, we look at the length, the sections, the divisions in the book. We uh, assess the images, the tables or photographs that are needed to be inserted in the book and whether we have high quality images, what delivery formats are being considered also um, affects the cost for the book. Who is the audience for the book? Because this impacts the look and feel that we want to create, the language that we use in the book, and how we insert or where we insert the images. Then we create timelines for completion and work those detail, details out with the authors. Here are some, some things that we've learned in this process. Authors are usually more involved in the book production process. 
with a library publishing program, it may not be the same as what they go through with a commercial publisher. So this is something that they need to get used to. There's more time spent with us. Timelines for creation may be shorter. We usually end up doing books within about 18 months, but expectations uh, from authors tend to be shorter. They want the book created tomorrow. Um, CC licenses, we find that we need to explain what this means and how it works. So to recap, do the book in-house or do we outsource this book? What I thought I'd do is um, address or talk about this in terms of how I developed staffing for our office. What we started off with is just myself, some time dedicated to this area while I had other responsibilities. Soon we amalgamated the copyright and publishing functions in my unit. Those were my roles and seemed to have to make the most sense at the time. I had an opportunity six years ago to add one rights management coordinator for the copyright area. Initially, she assisted with reviewing the images, figures, and drafts for the book. She informed authors about the need to seek permissions or to use alternative resources. It was not easy for authors to understand what is needed with an open access book or an open textbook. So what we did was we sought the permissions on, on their behalf. Soon I found that I needed to revise her job description to provide more capacity. Now she's the digital rights management and publishing coordinator. It meant going through a job evaluation process, which took a lot of time. And I had to ensure that I had funding approval before I started uh, the evaluation or the re-evaluation. Uh, what Eventually, this meant was that I could build some extra capacity in the department. Now she manages timelines for each project and keeps me on track with deadlines as well. This I found was the most important piece of having a service or a program, just having someone manage these timelines. The copyright side of the department was also growing and we were able to add two more staff to the office. In the first two years of adding these two staff, I realized that our needs were growing in both areas. We added indexing and managing journal publishing to one of the positions because of the staff member's capacity to do this. Again, I revised her job description when she left to pursue other opportunities. I hired to build further capacity in the position and hired someone with book design expertise. This staff member can handle the production of online textbooks and works on some books that don't have as much funding or have complicated referencing. The in-house books follow the same workflow processes that we use with an external designer. We have co-opted librarians in some of our projects. For example, I asked a librarian to work with me on the Japanese internment project he helped a great deal with the cultural references. The staff at the Japanese museum that we worked with were also very, very helpful. I've hired interns uh, in, in the last few years, and one of the responsibilities was to work on a book project. Soon we'll be putting out a call for proposals for open textbooks on campus. We will be setting up a project group that includes faculty, students, teaching assistants, librarians, a technology expert, and a publishing staff member as a resource for each project. The criteria for these open textbook projects is um, ones that have high enrollment courses, high textbook course, uh, costs, multiple sections, and they all have to be undergraduate courses, and publishing with a CC license. The grants will be administered by the Learning and Teaching Center. A huge part of the grants were funded by undergraduate students with some contributions from the Learning and Teaching Center and the library. Authors are expected to produce a half-term report and a final report, and they agree to showcase their project at a workshop to share their experience. The library will be providing workshops for faculty, students, librarians to use Pressbooks to build further capacity in the production of online textbooks. 
will be enlisting the help of BC Campus when needed to speak about textbook development as well. Next, I'd like to talk about uh, the design and costs. So the question of using in-house capacity to create or outsource the design and layout would be based on, is this a scholarly work or a textbook that's produced online? And we would choose where to go in that case. Whether it's a short work or whether it's complicated, whether there's sufficient funding to outsource the project. Timing of the project is also important. If we are dealing with multiple projects, our staff in-house might not be able to take this on. So that's when I decide, and if we have funding, we decide to go and outsource the project. If you're outsourcing, here are some of the things that I've learned that you need to think about. Once you receive a draft invoice from your book designer, and the author has approved the cost, you need to pay 50% of the cost upfront and 50% of the cost on uh, delivery of the files to the printer. One of the things that we've come across in terms of where cost overruns, overruns occur is when authors edit the galley proofs over and over again. You may have to limit the number of uh, edits to the final versions. With high quality graphics, be, be aware that there may be time spent on cropping and sharpening the images, and these may increase your design costs as well. One of the things that we usually ask our designer is, and this is for in-house design or one you contract with, is to get two or three templates for a design for a book. And then you can choose from them or combine aspects that you like from those two or three designs. Choose fonts that you have access to as well. Here is a sample book design invoice and what it might include. Design costs do not include editing and copy editing costs, so you will have to take care of those outside of this invoice. What we found is usually a 150 page book costs about $5,000 to design. And costs go up when authors have multiple edits on galley proofs, as I mentioned. Copy editing we found may cost between $40 and $50 an hour, and this is an additional cost to take into account. Uh, we hope that authors can subsidize this work, but sometimes this doesn't happen and we do it in-house here. As far as marketing goes, we deliver our books by an online platform to any individuals or institutions for free. And we recently worked with Project News to uh, get a contract with them. It costs uh, $150 US to convert our titles, each title to XML. There are no extra access restrictions for our open access books on this platform and it includes a perpetual license. We work with authors to submit titles for awards. Submissions are made to a related association. And one thing to note is that you need to submit print copies for these proposals. For example, we uh, sent in a proposal two years ago to the Distinguished Book Award for the American Alliance for Theater and Education for one of our books and received this award, which was great for our program. We also post information about the book on blogs, Twitter, listservs, sending out, getting the authors to send it out via emails. Uh, one of our authors went for a conference and did a book launch at the, at the conference as well. So use as many avenues as possible to advertise your book. Copyright and licensing. With all our books, the author owns copyright and we publish with either a CC BY or a CC BY NC license, and we have a non-exclusive license to host and market the title. In the future, what are we thinking of trying to do to add to our service? We don't have a, a formalized publication agreement at the moment, so that's something that we would like to get going and uh, it's just finding time with our general counsel to create a publication agreement. We want to assign DOIs for each of our titles. 
and we're definitely looking at producing more textbooks in the near future. We're considering the option of creating an advisory board to review book proposals. But one of the things that we'll have to ensure is that we still have a diversity of titles and inclusive, being inclusive as well. We're looking for options for alternative peer review models as well. And we may consider integrating the two publishing service brands at some point. The challenges that we've faced. Um, managing author expectation is the, one of the biggest challenges. They usually want more than we can provide. For example, one of them wanted an interactive book that would have cost us a great deal and the funding wasn't there for it. Uh, another one wanted the book on a website with additional auxiliary resources attached to it. We didn't have the capacity to do that kind of work. Managing timelines and priorities. This is another huge challenge and having somebody who would watch for all of these things for you would be an important consideration. The, time, the timelines change because of the edits that are worked on. And if you have multiple authors in a book uh, working on different chapters, that takes a lot longer to process than you have with one author working on the whole book. Handling copyright permissions and licensing. As I mentioned before, um, authors don't understand how you use images in an open textbook. So this is something that you want to talk to them right up front when you've reviewed the contents of the book. Usually they are going out and looking for images that you can't actually use in an open textbook. So you're constantly teaching them how to find other resources or you're finding the resources and helping them uh, decide on which ones to choose. So this again, lengthens your timeline. Managing cost overruns. This is something that they don't think about. They know they have a certain amount of money, but they forget this when they're doing the edits. Um, print on demand. This is a question that I've recently started to ask myself, do we want to do this or simply just offer the books up online? Uh, print on demand can be expensive. Uh, we've not been able to find a way to do this so that the books cost the same all down the road uh, as people buy it. Um, the other question that we've had is, how do we bring library employees on board when you're dealing with an organization that has different employee agreements and you have to take into consideration their job description as well. So we're slowly working on some things. Librarians are easily, uh, you can easily convince them and co-opt them into different projects uh, because they already work with those departments and those faculty members in those departments. So that may be an easier way to go or hiring an intern would be an easier way to go. But using the other staff members in your organization may require a little more thought. Um, that's all I have at the moment. And I'll leave it for questions at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Imba. I would like to invite all of you to post your questions in the chat. You're also very welcome to turn on your video so we can see one another or unmute your microphone if you prefer to ask your question that way. Uh, just to recap, Imba just talked to us uh, very thoughtfully about how she implemented a publishing program at her institution. And this is the final of three webinars. We started with Should You Publish with Joan Warren, how should you publish with Kevin Hawkins? And then today we really got into the nitty gritty of implementing a publishing program. So we'll make these three webinars available, including the slides to all of you uh, with any luck next week. Uh, in addition to your questions, if Emba spoke about something um, that you have struggled with or uh, addressed at your institution, please feel free to share it. Um, with others who are in this call because there's uh, more than one way to do things. So uh, I will also ask a question as you're thinking of yours. Uh, Imba, you mentioned um, securing funding for a designer and I would uh, love to hear a little bit more about the process of working with the designer and, and how that went and what you've learned over the course of uh, working with the designer on a few projects. 
Hmm. Um, we've actually been very, very lucky to have a designer that has been working on a number of different projects and different types of projects and is very, very professional. So what we do usually is um, when we get a book project and it's fully edited, we send him the book project. So we send him all the files, the word files. And we ask him for an invoice at first, determining what the possible cost for the end product would be, telling him that we want uh, the different types of outputs, like PDF, EPUB. Um, and then what he does is he comes back with an initial invoice or a draft invoice. And we take that invoice and we work with the author to ensure that they understand all the aspects. One of the things that I found that I, as I mentioned, the cost overruns can occur because his um, costs when we're doing the edits on the galley proofs gets up to $85 an hour. So that can actually be quite onerous. Um, so we make sure that the authors know about this. And then once they've approved it, what we do is we ask him to give us the three templates. And he's been great with this. He looks around to see uh, different books uh, and the designs that are used. He will also take into consideration anything you give him as a design option. So sometimes we've looked at different books uh, in that subject area and say, hey, can you do something like this and add this kind of element or pieces like that? And he's come back to us with two or three design templates. And usually it's three, which is great. Um, with one book, we actually took pieces out of each design and amalgamated them and he produced another version. So that was great. He will go back and forth with us on the design. So that's another piece that you want to have your designer do for you. Um, and then once that's uh, designed, we give it back to the authors and they approve the design. And then he starts working on the book and he'll ask questions as we go along. Uh, and he has been one of those people that actually looks at your book as he's putting it in the template. Um, not all designers will do that. Uh, he actually looks at the content. Some of them will say, this is all I'm doing. I'm designing a book. You take care of the content. I'm not going to worry about that. Whereas he actually looks at your content in, in relation to the, the design that he's come up with. So that's really great. We have another set of eyes. So you want to find somebody who would do that with you and work with you. So we've worked with him on a number of projects. In fact, both our library publishing streams use the same designer. So it's been great that way. So we've developed quite a good relationship with him. Yeah, having, having that consistency, I think, can mm -hmm. really pay off. Yeah, and he knows what your expectations are after a time, too, so that's helpful. Mm -hmm. And you also talked about having a great relationship with your bookstore for print-on-demand. Yeah. a little bit more about that? Sure. We, we started our relationship with the bookstore, uh, especially with the whole copyright area. And as we got uh, closer and closer in our relationship, what I suggest that when we started to publish our journals and publish our books with the journals, we worked with them to um, get print copies. So I always sent the students their way to get print copies for their journal issues when they wanted to do a launch. And so we worked the same thing out with our books as well. So they've also, in, in a great way, created one page at the bookstore's website where they list our university publications. And it's not just publications from our unit, but any other publications from the university. And what they agreed to do on that page is to have a link to the e-version that can be downloaded and a link to uh, the bookstore to get a book printed and sold. So they take care of all the selling of the print copies, which is great for us. Uh, they're an organization that deals with this kind of area. So we thought, why reinvent the wheel? We'll work with them on it. And they work with our print shop to get the printing done for those books as well. Great. I am going to ask two more questions, but uh, I invite others again, if you have a question, let us know in the chat or go ahead and interrupt us by turning on your microphone. 
Um, Imba, you talked um, a few times about authors' high expectations and how that can be a challenge and a negotiation. Can you say a little bit more about effective ways to manage those expectations or clarify what services you're going to offer and on what timeline? Mm -hmm. So um, our Web of Performance book is a really good example for it. Uh, it's that theater book I was talking about. And the authors were expecting a book because it was for high schools. They wanted a certain kind of look and feel for the book. And then they were the ones that were asking for the website as well. They wanted an interactive book. But it came down to talking to them initially. So having a publication agreement is actually a good idea is what we learned is you need to be upfront with them and say, this is the amount of money you're bringing in. This is what the book is going to cost to produce. Anything extra would be, we would need extra funding to do that. Just because we have an in-house service here that has sunk costs already attached to it doesn't mean that we have the time to do all of those pieces as well. So sometimes they come in thinking, well, you're doing this, I'm sure you can do this too. So, you know, it's talking them down and saying, this is all we can offer right up front and then constantly reminding them about it too. Uh, even when they have, you know, they're using images that they want to use from elsewhere, telling them that it's an extra cost to get those images, to use those images, this time that we spend to get permissions for those images can be onerous. So it's those kinds of things that, you know, we're teaching them about. So I would say there's learning on both sides and, you know, we come out hopefully, you know, with still a positive relationship with those authors, uh, but you constantly have to remind them about it. So having that upfront conversation about what you can offer and only what you can offer mm -hmm. and then stopping there and saying that you have a student, maybe we can work with them on something, that kind of thing. So, but you know, a lot of the authors that we work with also have um, uh, been really good about marketing their own books. So, you know, like I mentioned, one of them took the book and uh, made copies of the book, took it to a conference and had a book launch at the conference. So that was great. That is great. Um, it's nice to partner on marketing. Um, because any, any partnership when it comes to getting the word out helps. And then I'm just going to add on to your comment around images that likewise, um, there can be a lot involved in um, working with faculty on the education piece in terms of like, this is an openly licensed image. This is not, if we're going to openly license the book, these are the images um, that we can include. And that some people find it helpful to ask for a sample chapter. So you can see early on, wait a minute, <laughs> yeah where are these images coming from this isn't going to work or things like that right yeah and it, you just reminded me of something else we do with our designer is we give him the worst chapter possible to design with as well because then it would include the images the graphs anything that you know you have extensive content or different types of content in it mm -hmm. so that you can actually see the design laid out well the range of elements that will be included. exactly yeah mm -hmm. so i have a question here in the chat from emily i don't think other people can see it so i'm going to go ahead and read it can you talk some more about the final file formats you end up with and the process of working with project muse for xml mm, okay um we have gone with uh, we started off doing just pdfs and then we realized that we should be doing epubs um, but EPUBs, the conversion to EPUBs can be quite a problem. So we only do PDFs and EPUBs when we're working with the external designer because he has a lot of experience around this area. Whereas when we do something in-house, that's why that was one of the considerations of when we go to in-house as well. Uh, working with open textbooks and if you work with the Pressbooks platform, it produces those kind of versions for you. So that's great. Uh, but EPUBs can be uh, quite onerous to look at and make sure that they all appear correctly. You have to do a lot of testing around them as well. Um, but with our external designer, the experience is there. They will look at those things. 
Um, what was the last question? I can't remember. The process of working with Project Muse for XML. Uh, right. So um, we only worked with, uh, started working with Project Muse in December, actually. And what we did was we, um, we had to give them, so if you're working with someone like them, you have to have EPUB files. That's the other thing. So we only um, set them copies of titles where we had EPUB versions. So what they will do is you send them the EPUB versions and they will convert them to XML for you. So you're not having to do that work. And what I found is um, they charge $150 US for that conversion and then putting it onto their open book uh, platform. Uh, if you go outside to do a conversion to XML, that could be another cost factor. Uh, we had to do that with one of our health um, books. Uh, we had it um, uploaded to PubMed uh, and the conversion was something that we had to pay for. So thankfully the researcher had some extra grant funds so that we could pay for that uh, conversion. And that one we went out contracting as well uh, to get that vision. Thanks, Imba. I would like to just make a comment that a lot of the issues that we're talking about here in terms of file conversion, working with designers and other um, professionals in outsourcing what needs to be done uh, to create a book is something that we have um, addressed in the publishing cooperative through the OTN and through our partnership with Scribe. Because um, in listening to Imba, as you can hear, there's a lot involved in, for example, converting a file to EPUB and making sure that that conversion goes well. So that's something, if you're interested, we can train you to do. Uh, it is difficult, or if you prefer, you would have um, access to, um, to professionals who can do that for you. Okay. So um, Kathy has a question. How do you handle peer review and accessibility issues? Oh, okay. That's a very good question. Peer review is something that we're still working on. Um, when we can, uh, if the author has some outside source, um, someone who is part of an organization closely related to that subject content, then we've asked for peer review to be done of that book. Uh, and we do it in this one case, we did it before the book was published so that the peer review was inserted into the forward, uh, which was great. Or we, in the instance with um, our law textbook on global corruption, the peer review came in after, because, um, and we put it into the, on the back cover of the book. So we had little snippets of what people thought about that textbook on the back cover. Uh, we haven't done the traditional peer review piece for textbook uh, for any of our books yet. And that's a question that I have. Um, certainly don't have that expertise in-house. So it would mean setting up a board, an advisory board, an editorial board of some kind. It's something our university librarian would like to see but that's another layer that we add into timelines, uh, whole other issues that come with it. And whether, you know, we have, I would think we would have to think about um, the diversity of the projects uh, because they would, any peer reviewer you get will be so used to the traditional publishing environment and whether they would restrict some of the publishing we do would be something that you want to think about. Um, accessibility issues, we've certainly started looking at this, especially with our open textbooks. Two of, two of our staff members attended an accessibility workshop talking about this, so we've started to implement some of these pieces into our online textbook area, uh, especially around images and the kind of contents that we put in there, putting alt text, so we're testing it with um, accessibility type sites, tools that we, we know about. So those two staff members are looking into those, especially with our textbook area. I hope that helps. And I'll add on the peer review question uh, that I think it's an open question. 
you know, commercial textbook publishers tend to use peer review as a marketing opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, as Emba describes, some of the peer review um, they've done, they include, you know, blurbs on the back cover. I think that that's um, a good example of like a common sort of textbook peer review. Um, and so I think it's, again, an open question as to whether it needs to go through the same type of review that a scholarly um, publication would. Mm -hmm. I see Sunny here has a question um, about images. Are copyright owners of images amenable to allowing their images to be used in OER works? So I would just like to say a, a, a blurb about that, um, and then I'll hand it to you, Imba. Mm -hmm. um, if the copyright owners of images um, are willing to openly license their work, then that would work, I think, in a, in a textbook, um, yeah. at least in an open textbook as we um, evaluate them for the open textbook library. Imba, is there anything you would like to add? No, I agree totally with that. And that's what we look at first is look for images. And we tend to use extensively the Creative Commons website where they have the tool to do a search across the board and all kinds of different resources to find openly licensed images and use those first. So what we do is try to find something close to what the author came up with in the beginning and mm -hmm. then say, hey, you know, how about this or this? But the other thing to also uh, be aware of is when you look for those images, make sure that those image sites have high quality resolution images as well to be able to download. Otherwise, it's not gonna work for you. Uh, when you start sizing them, that's when it doesn't work. So be aware of that. And uh, one of our books, our uh, Knowing Home book, we, what we did was we contracted, because we had a grant, we contracted with artists to produce illustrations. So they knew up front what we were asking for as well and were amenable to having it in an open textbook. But we also made sure that um, any anyone else who wants to use that image would have to go directly to them to ask for permission to use those images. Those were specially designed for the book. I'm gonna try and fit in one more question. Um, if there's anyone else out there who would like to do the same, please, uh, please do. You mentioned uh, collaborative funding that a few different organizations on campus were chipping in. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us how that came to be? Oh, that was really interesting, and it's, it's happened in the last two months, actually. Our undergraduate student society came or went to the Learning and Teaching Center and said, our class of 2019 wants to devote $8,000 to a textbook initiative, open textbook initiative, and said, can you help us with uh, drafting proposals and getting faculty involved in creating, adopting, adapting something uh, to create better uh, situations for the students. Uh, so once that came around, uh, the director from the Learning and Teaching Center started talking to the library because she knew that we already did this kind of work. And as we were talking, I asked whether there was additional funding available to add to that $8,000. And then the, the Learning and Teaching Center decided to you know uh, contribute a little extra and the library matched that fund so we're up to about thousand dollars on that uh, initiative which was great uh, and i think it's great that the students came up with the idea so what we've helped what we've done is helped him uh, design his call for proposals from the faculty and we we started off with working with what the learning and teaching center does and since they do it on an annual basis anyway with some of the other programs, they agreed to administer the fund and work with departments and faculty on it. But we were working in collaboration with them on any projects that come through. That is a great story. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, we're almost at the end of the hour. Um, I would invite everyone to join me in thanking Imba Kehoe for sharing her story and all of the um, details that go into uh, creating and managing a publishing program. As I mentioned earlier, I will um, work on sending out the three webinars and slides, hopefully next week, so that you can reference them. 
And in the meantime, I uh, wish you all well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for being here. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.